Well, take your Bibles and find Revelation 18. Last week we went over Revelation 17 and the this concept and idea of Babylon and very much presented in chapter 17 and in the uh, in the form of religion and presented there in chapter 17 as a harlot and that has been God's classic example uh, for uh, spiritual adultery through Scripture. Because God's intention is to be somewhat of man's husband. That a woman is to her husband as the church is to Christ, and a Christ is, I'm sorry, a man is to his wife as Christ is to the church. And going back to Genesis and the creation of man and woman and their interaction, that the primary purpose of God's creating man and woman has been for us to our understand our relationship with God. It is just one of the elements or institutions, you could say, that has been put into our lives to help us to understand our relationship with Him. Another thing is our own children, having our own children and, and you know, go and replenish the earth, as it is said, or go and populate the earth. Maybe it could be better translated. And God intended for us to have children, and the fruit of the womb is his reward, is what the Scripture says. And blessed is the man who has a quiver full of arrows, right? In other words, what he means is a, is a little house full of hanyaks running around and, you know, a little handful of rascals. And like, why is he so blessed? He might have a few more headaches, you know, but yes, but he is really blessed because he has a bunch of little illustrations running around helping to illustrate his relationship to God. I can't begin to tell you how big of an impact my children have had on me in regards to my relationship with the Father. And uh, a, a very, I won't say an easy <laughs> impact, you know. It, it might have, I, I might have even, you know, been a grown man crying a couple times, but, but it's giving me an understanding with the feeling. You know, uh, so God has to put a feeling with it, you know, for me, uh, because I'm so, you know, carnal and natural. You know, I really can't appreciate what he's trying to say unless he gives me a feeling. And then, boy, sometimes those feelings have a high appraisal, though, and they can be a little expensive, but but they sure are valuable. And so he presents Babylon as a harlot. And here we progress into chapter 18, which almost seems to be the same thing, yet it's a little bit different, and there's a lot of ideas. Some people think it's the exact same thing, just repeated twice. I, I don't believe so. Not in consecutive chapters in the Bible. I do think that there's a distinction. Um, there's quite a few different opinions regarding it, so take what I say with a grain of salt. You may disagree. Uh, these things, I don't believe, are absolutely certain, but we search the Scriptures, trying to make sense and put things together. And what we know to be absolutely certain, like Christ on the cross for us, to be a propitiation for our, our sin, yeah, we teach that with all authority and demand it. But then some things which we don't know with certainty, well, we look with consideration into Scripture and some of these things are like that. So don't stone me with pea gravel when we leave here. If, um, if I say something disagreeable, I'm just a man trying to sort through these things and understand between Daniel and Ezekiel and Zechariah and, and uh, a few mentions through the epistles and, and here in, in Revelation trying to put all these things together and I myself have my own struggles. Uh, chapter 18. After these things, after what things? After he saw, you know, the harlot on the many waters, you know, Babylon on a great number of multitudes of people. After he saw the harlot on the satanic beast, that dark kingdom that's represented there, uh, that he saw that that same harlot rode on the power of that beast. And not only that, but he saw in the end, 
that that great multitude that those kings had turned on them and had killed them and had persecuted them. And uh, where is that? It's down there in the very last bit, chapter, uh, verse 15 and 16, 17 there in verse 8, 17. I'm sorry, chapter 17. He said, and when he said to me, the waters which you saw where the harlot sits the, the, are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. And the ten horns which you saw and the beast, these will hate the harlot and will make her desolate and naked and will eat her flesh and will burn up with fire. Now, if you thought you had a cantankerous horse back in the day, the, the horse didn't eat you. You know, and and uh, tear you up. Maybe he tore you tore you up. But but this beast that she was riding turned on her, and I'll mention that here later, and maybe to help us distinguish chapter seventeen and chapter eighteen. And after these things is what John is saying. I saw another angel, a different one, not one of the seven of the, of the seven vials of wrath, but another angel coming down from heaven. Uh, obviously. Uh, a very powerful angel. He said, having great authority and the earth was illuminated with his glory. And he cried out with a mighty voice saying, fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. And she has become a dwelling place of demons and a prison of every unclean spirit and a prison of every unclean, hateful bird. And all the nations have drunk of the wine of the passion of her immorality. And the kings of the earth have committed acts of immorality with her. And the merchants of the earth have become rich by the wealth of her sensuality. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that you may not participate in her sins, and that you may not receive of her plagues. Let's pray. Father, Lord, this word is preserved for us by the blood of many. Lord, for our understanding, for our edification, God, you even said in this book, for our blessing. And so let us be blessed in it because that is your will and we pray according to your will that in seeking you out in this word, word that you will bless us, God, that you will give us understanding. And Lord, I pray that you would make it normative and apply it to our lives, God, and that we might know what we do with it, Father, in our decisions, in our actions as we leave this building today and go about this week to try to walk in sanctity and separateness, Father, and, and live out our lives wholly unto you. Bless us in your word, I pray in Christ's name. Amen. <clears throat> and so you see that it's very similar in what they mention. They don't uh, emphasize the presentation of her as a harlot, but nevertheless, this angel comes, a mighty angel, illuminating, illuminating the earth and crying out, fallen, fallen, is Babylon the Great. Now, if you're familiar with Zionists and reggae, you know, all you show witness when Babylon fall. Yeah, I don't know if any of y'all listen to reggae music, but, you know, there's a lot of Zionists, which is a religion in reggae, and they, and they very much look at Babylon as the evil kingdom. And it's something that they got right. But poor Bob Marley, he died because he had one skin cancerous toe, and he refused to cut it off because he's a Zionist. And they believe that you have to, you know, Behold, you can't have an amputation. And uh, so just a quirk of, you know, Zionism. But, uh, but they do have Babylon right. And they understand and they look at the kingdom of Satan, the kingdom of darkness is Babylon. And there's a lot of discussion, at, you know, in this chapter 18 and 17 is, is Babylon a geographical location or is it an ideology? Or is it a worldwide spread kingdom? I say yes and both. Yes, there will be a geographical location. I don't know that it'll be over in Iraq area where Babylon was historically under Nebuchadnezzar and, and Belshazzar and, and those individuals, but I think Nabonidus was also a Babylonian king. But, you know, that we ended chapter 17 with it talking about, you know, the city of seven hills. And if we go back to Daniel chapter 7, we realize that this kingdom is also wrapped into the fourth beast of Daniel, which was Rome. And you say, well, how could, you know, Rome has been gone, right, since 1200, you know, and how, and how could it still be? Well, the, the geographical area and the nations are still present, and it's the idea is that it'll be those nations and that geographical area that will come together to be the center of Antichrist's 
reign and kingdom. And so it would also make very much sense for literally Rome, the city of seven hills, just like, you know, chapter 17 refers to the city of seven hills, to be this center, you know? And, you know, and if you disagree and if that's wrong, well, I'll, I'll be wrong, but I'm not losing my salvation over it, right? <laughs> but, but it certainly makes sense. You know, it's, it's an idea and it's a concept that is there. But not only is it, well, in, and they speak of it later in this chapter, is watching from afar and literally watching a city burn and get destroyed. And yes, yes, I really believe there will be a geographical location, you know, where Antichrist reigns. But I also believe that God is talking about something here that has spanned the time since Genesis chapter 10, since a man named Nimrod which ironically means a rebel, <laughs> you know, rebellion. Uh, I, you know, I'm glad we didn't have a kid that we needed to name Nimrod, you know, probably because he didn't have a boy. You know, if I wonder, God, why didn't, have, you know, why didn't I have a boy? I only had three girls. He said, well, he would have been like you. And, and I, when I say, thank you, Lord, I'll wait for a grandson. You know, maybe I should have been called Nimrod, but rebel. And what did this rebel do? Well, they were the first group of people to organize themselves collectively against the will of God. If you ask me what is Babylon, I would tell you secularism. Even if you go look up the definition of secularism today and you, and you look at the world's definition, of, it's, it's ideologies and acts and, you know, that are separate from religion and apart from the concept of God. So, you know, political science people over the last 150 years or whatever have, have looked at, you know, communist institutions like Red China, you know, that they describe them as secular because they have to totally obliterate any concept of God and form their own truth. And indeed, the, the government becomes God. And that's why they, they totally outlaw any worship of God or concept of God or mention of God, that they're truly secular. And that's, that's the intellectual use of the word. But, you know, for us, secular, I believe the idea is independence from God. That I want to come up with my own idea and I want to have my own purpose and I want to have my own agenda and my own way of doing things. And that's what Nimrod did there in that city-state that they created. And the God said, look at them, they're all united with one language. And that day when God confused their language, he divided secularism since then. And they have not been able to unite the world again, the population of the world, in a, in a one-world agenda. But do you realize that that's what Antichrist will do? He's not going to be a few countries. He's not going to be a one country that's the superpower. He will be the world leader. And he will have the world united, just like Nimrod had all the people united, for one ungodly purpose, independent of God. And that's been the perpetuation of the idea of Babylon. And even here, you know, we get up to this point and it's operating independently of God. And I, you know, I meant to mention last week, and, and uh, Pastor Mac mentioned it, and I was like, well, yeah, I meant, I meant to mention that. But uh, a lot of times, I think Scripture uses the, the term world. Like Jesus said, you know, that not as the world gives do I give. He said, the world's got one way of giving, but I've got a different way of giving, and it's not the world, the way the world gives. Uh, John said this in 1 John 2.15. He said that, do not love the world, nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And what is he talking about? Well, we know well enough what he's talking about, the way the world operates, the way the world functions, and the way the world thinks and acts. And, and, and it doesn't take very long into your relationship with Christ to know that, that you're now in opposition to that thinking and that acting and, and everything, the way they do it. But remember those things, what he said, for all that is in the world is the lust of the flesh. We could call that sensualism. Whatever sensual. This tastes good. This feels good. That looks good. 
that sounds good, right? And, and going through all of those senses, the lust of the flesh and that which is physically pleasing. And he said, the lust of the eyes. You remember when Jesus was talking about the, the love of money? And he says, the eye is the light of the body, but if the, but if the eye is bad, and, you, and it's hard for us to understand what he means, but he's, I, I've told you all a hundred times, uh, the poem, This Life's Dim Windows of the Soul, the, <laughs> you know, what, what shine, you know, where light comes in, this life's dim windows of the soul distort the heavens from pole to pole, and goad you to believe a lie when you see with and not through the eye. But Jesus said, but if the light is bad, you can't properly perceive things. In other words, if, if the truth, you know, if what you're perceiving that comes through this eye and shines inside your body, he's not talking about shining out, he's talking about shining in. You know, and he says, and you can't properly perceive the value of human life, and you can't properly perceive the value of money and of God and put them in their place. And then he ends it with, hey, you can't serve both God and mammon. It's rather a confusing verse. It's stuck right there in the middle of, a, you know, this thing that's all about money. You're like, well, what does he mean about the eye? You know, but, but that's what he's talking about, sensationalism. Perceiving, you know, with the eye. And that looks good, and that is, that's the seed of covetousness. I want that. You know, and so there's sensualism, there's sensationalism, and last of all, the pride of life, there's selfism. And, and wanting to promote yourself, and we see those same ideas echoed here in chapter 18 in, the, in Babylon, and the thinking of it. And we go through here, chapter 2, he says... Uh, I'm sorry, verse 2. He cried, Fallen, fallen is the great, and she has become a dwelling place of demons, a prison of every unclean spirit, and a prison of every unclean and hateful bird. And you know, some of the bird is a little confusing, and maybe you might think that, I heard somebody say this week that that was an expositional constant for evil. And I say, well, I don't know. There was a dove that represented the Spirit of God. And I, so I don't know that it's an expositional constant. That's a theological term. In, in other words, like leaven is an expositional constant for sin. Wherever you find leaven in Scripture, it's talking about sin. What did they do when they, they were, Passover was approaching? They went through their house and they cleaned out all the leaven, right? And they purged it all out. Paul warned the Corinthians. He said, don't you know a little leaven leavens the whole lump? And he was wanting them to you know, purify themselves and keep a holy congregation, you know, and that somebody like a, uh, that man having an affair with his mother-in-law, that he was to be put out of the church, you know, since he was unrepentant. But, you know, the, I don't know that birds can be considered a spiritual constant, but we do see examples of them. When Abraham was making a very sacred and holy covenant with God, some birds I would imagine that where scavengers landed trying to eat the sacrifices and Abraham had to chase them away, interfering with the process of the covenant. Not only that, but in the parable of the soils, when the seed, the, the gospel message was scattered by the wayside, what came to devour it? The birds came to snatch away that gospel message. But I think really more than anything, this is just a, a, a demoting term to the demonic you know, because demons fly, you know, angels fly. That's just a characteristic that they have. But I think a demoting term to the demonic, but here we get into the real meat of it in verse 3. And he says, For all nations uh, have drunk of the wine of the passion of her immorality. And I don't believe he means all nations present at the time. I think he means all nations, like since the beginning of time, have done this. And what are the effects of Babylon and whatever this is? And he says that all nations have drunk of the wine. So there's an idea of intoxication, of inebriation. We know what, you know, alcohol does, the effect that it has. And, you know, and I don't think he's talking about in small amounts. I think he's talking about debauchery and in, in large amounts that, that you not you you give control of your body over to intoxication and you submit unto it and if you drink enough well it controls it affects how you speak and it affects how you think you ever seen anybody so 
I, I know it's not a nice word if we didn't let our kids say it when they're little, but so stupid as when they're drunk. You know, some guy, and you all know the country song, every time I drink, I start to think I'm 10 feet tall and bulletproof. You know, and you're like, man, this guy is really stupid. No, he's not stupid. He's just drunk. You know, he, think he, he thinks he can beat up 10 guys at one time, you know, and totally lose his senses and what he's thinking and what he's doing. And he's intoxicated. And he can't think right, and he can't act right, and he can't move right and talk right or do anything right because he's intoxicated. I believe that's the picture that's given here, that he's drunk. they've drunk of the wine of, of what? Of the passion of her immorality. And the kings of the earth have committed acts of immorality with her, and the merchants of the earth have become rich by, her wealth, by the wealth of her sensuality. Now, what are these things here? There's, there's three things mentioned. Talking about riches, talking about sensuality, and they're talking about later in verse 7, pride. Hmm, does that sound familiar? For all that is in the world, right? The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life. That's the nature of man. And you, you may have not had all three of those. And you might say, well, I wasn't lustful, and I wasn't sensual, and I'm a pretty good person. Well, you're on the third one, really good, boastful pride of life. You know, you're an expert at the third one. But you find that you're really good at least one of those three. I was good at all three, you know, so I was an overachiever. And where sin did abound, grace did have to abound much more in my life. But, but uh, those are the things. And that's the, what's behind Babylon. And that's what drives it, and that's what affects it, and that's, that's, that's how they do their business. That's how the world operates, that they were drunk, what with passion of her immorality, and not look at the people who, who are involved in this. First of all, all nations, all people, nobody's excluded. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, right? There's no good, no, not one. We know the nature of man, that through one man sin entered the world, and if there's somebody here that's not a descendant of Adam, well, you know, there's, there's something wrong there. You know, but we, we know, and we know our nature. And if you're not sure about your nature, just ask your sibling or your spouse, and they can tell you about your neighbor, since they know you so well, and they have to live with you. Right? And so it's all nations. And what are, you know, what are these nations? Well, they're sensual. They're prideful. You know, that's, that's what we are in our nature. And so there's, there's people, nations, there's kings, there's rulers, right, that are affected by it. And then the third group that was given was merchants, commerce, business. And all of these things work together. You know, the, the people are driven by sensuality, sensationalism, and pride. You don't think politicians don't know that? Have you not seen politicians really manipulate people in this country in the last few years? I mean, just absolutely manipulate and instigate and cause people to react and you know, to, to do things that they want them to do. And, and how are they doing that? Well, they just play on the, you know, the right cards. Let's play on these people's pride. Let's play on their entitlement, their feeling of entitlement. You know, if anything, we, we definitely need, you know, that, that that's, that's how they manipulate them. They manipulate them because they are bound to those types of behaviors. They, they can't get away from them. It's their nature. And so the rulers manipulate in that way. And not only that, but the merchants what, what did the merchants do? And the merchants of the earth have become rich by the wealth of her sensuality. I don't know why they, they gave the, the translation wealth. That word is not translated wealth anywhere else. I don't know how your translation is translated. Y'all know really what that word is in Greek is dynamis, dynamo. Y'all probably know that, that word. I mean, you know, if you listen to enough Bible teaching, that's where we get the word dynamite. Really, it's translated most often power, power. You know, and how did they do? They became rich by the power of her sensuality. Don't you know how to manipulate people yet? I mean, 
some of us are good psychopaths and others not so much, but, uh, or sociopaths, I should say, but, you know, you, you manipulate people according to their desires and their sensualities. You don't tell, you, you know how, you, you all know how to sell a diet. This is, how, is this how you sell a, sell a diet? Listen, you're going to have to really give up a lot of things you love, and you're going to have to work really hard. You know, and there's going to be some suffering and some doing without. And there's going to be some days where, you know, you're just really upset and it's going to throw. No, that's not. Oh, no. No. Y'all, I think the worst one that ever came out was Sensa. Y'all remember Sensa? It just came and went really fast because then you don't have to change a thing. Just sprinkle this stuff on your food before you eat. Oh, yeah. No, 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 you know. Jeff, you don't have to stop eating the whole box of cookies at, at you know, 9 o'clock at night. You know, just sprinkle some sensa on those Oreos, you know. And, and you're like, that's silly, you know. Why would somebody, be- oh, why would somebody believe that? Mm. Because it does not interfere with our sensuality. Y'all ever heard of, I, I had a friend who was a wealthy guy in San Antonio, and he was driving a very nice vehicle one evening, and he pulled up to a gas station, and a and a, a young lady was, you know, pulled up, started pumping gas, a very attractive girl. She struck up a conversation with him, and she said, you know, she said, I'm just really all alone. And uh, she said, will you come back and stay with me in my apartment tonight? And he thought about it, and he said, I thought about it, not a Christian man. <laughs> and he said, no, no, I don't think so, you know, and, and he reported it to the police, and the police said, well, that's good. He said, there is a operation going on where, you know, men are seduced back to an apartment, and then there they are beaten up and mugged and robbed, and, you know, and he said it, it, it wasn't legit. It's very likely it wasn't legit. You know, oh, but you see how they're drawn away. How many times does the book of Proverbs warn a man about an immoral woman who have lips of honey, right? And she, and she looks and she sounds so good and she'll massage you, you know, your ego. And, and how are people drawn into these horrible decisions where they tear apart their marriage and their family and, and really damage the relationships that they have? And, well, they're, they're lured away by their desires, their sensuality. You know, how are people sold into false religion? where you're taught that you have to earn your salvation and that you have to be good enough, well, they're, they're drawn to the idea that they're good people and they're earning their way. And you see, they, they get to attribute some credit unto themselves and they get to have some pride in their salvation since indeed they had to work so hard to get it. And you find out the deception is, you know, it occurs according to the lusts of man. And, and whatever your lust is, or whatever your fear is, or whatever your issue is, emotionally, spiritually, psychologically, well, you just give somebody knowledgeable that information, and they'll know how to manipulate you. Are you afraid of dying? Oh, there's a horrible disease. Oh, you know, you know the same people that sell the panic, sell the cure? I don't know if you knew that or not. You know, the same people that sell the panic sell the cure. And, you know, they find out, you know, if you're a hypochondriatic, well, they've got a a sale pitch for you too. And, you know, they they manipulate people in that way. How did they become rich? By, by By the power of her sensuality. Well, because, and in that word, sensuality, strenos. Strain, it's a weird word. It's like a, a it's straining, literally. A straining, and it's, it's a, a breaking forth. And really, I think what it is, is it's a, a lusting desire to have and to want. Y'all remember James chapter 4, from whence comes quarrels and fightings among you? Does it not come from your lusts? You said you want, you do not have. And, and there is that desire and that straining and, and something like that. And all it does is take a very manipulative merchant. Oh, this is going to make your life better. You know, uh, you, I, I've always wondered 
Who were the men that ordered the pheromones in the back of Popular Mechanics? Y'all ever seen those advertisements? They're right there next to the shoes that give an extra inch to your height. That, yeah, if you, if you ever read Popular Mechanics, you know, or Popular Science back, you know, 20 years ago, 25 years ago, you're looking in the ads in the back, and I was a, you know, I was a little kid. It was probably more like 30 years ago, 35 years ago, and I was like, why would somebody order shoes that added an inch to your height? I was like, you know, what are they doing? And then right next to it, Dr. So-and-so with these pheromones, you will be irresistible to women. I mean, as a little kid, I read that, and I was like, that's got to be baloney. That's got to be baloney. Who orders that stuff? And listen, these people wouldn't buy an ad year after year after year after subscription after subscription if there wasn't somebody there purchase. And how, why, how could you be duped? Oh, because there is an unreasonable desire with you in your heart. Pardon the, the vulgar reference, but breast enlargement cream? Really? You know, it's been around for years and years and years and years. You're like, well, how could you believe that? Well, it's just the, an irresistible, uncontrollable, irrational desire to be more beautiful or to be more sensual or to be, you know, more appealing to a man or maybe rather to compete with your fellow woman. You know, how can people be so deceived? Well, in that very way, both by rulers and by merchants, both is, is how they were deceived. In verse 4, he says, And I heard another voice in heaven saying, Come out, from, uh, come out of her. Now, my people, that you may not participate in her sins and that you may not receive of her plagues. Now, I gave today a, a rather vague title that didn't it needs some explanation, a deadly drumbeat. Uh, I don't know. We, we have the euphemism marching to the beat of a different drum. And that comes from the history of drums in military. And drums were very much a, a key part in, in our military since independence and through the Civil War, and even still today. You know, there's drum corps in all, all four branches of armed services. And, you know, and that goes all the way back to ancient China. Ancient China was, as far as we know, was the first uh, nation to use, and the first people group to use drums in military, in warfare. And you're like, well, why, and why did they have them? Well, one of the main reasons why they had them was for moving soldiers and you know when they would march what did they do they had a cadence and what did that cadence do it set the pace you know and it told people how fast to walk and not only that but it unified them all and that way they were all unified well you hope you know we had a we did a lot of push-ups in boot camp for a few guys that were you know like you know, and they'd, you know, and they, they'd go all right for a few minutes, and then they'd be off again, and they'd spend most of their time marching like this, trying to get on the right foot, you know, and, you, and uh, oh, and I, you know, we'd have to stop about every, you know, quarter of a mile, and, all right, everybody, Spangler can't manage to get on the right foot, you know, we're going to let him march by himself while everybody does push-ups, you know, we do push-ups, and he would just, they have him marching in a circle, you know, and calling off cadences, and you're like, come on, man, just get to the drumbeat, you know, get on the cadence, and, and we can stop suffering here, you know, be unified with us, and that, that was the whole purpose of it. That, and this world is indeed marching to a drumbeat. The same problem in men's hearts here are the same problems in men's hearts over in Japan, in Russia, in Spain, you know, in Nigeria. And the same problem in women's hearts here is the same problem around the world and the same lusts that people have here, the same lusts that they have there and the desires. And, and you know, mankind is united in that sense. And the drive and the desire of, you know, commercialism and materialism that is there. I'm very sad to say that, you know, a great number of people have been so driven by consumerism and, and materialism to come to the United States. You know, and, and some have done very well, but listen, we've really seen some families destroyed. I can tell you quite a number 
of men that I have watched come from Mexico and Central America and have come over here and, you know, and they're going to do great and they work really hard and they do so good, you know, for the first few weeks and they save their money and they're not buying Cokes or lunches or anything like that and they're doing so well and, and then, you know, they need a, they need a new pair of boots. So they go to Trader's Village on Saturday and they get them a new pair of boots and ah, they really need a belt to match it. Then they got a belt to match it, you know, and then the, the next weekend, well, you know, I, I really need a new sombrero, you know, and then they, they get a new hat and they get a new pants and man, then they're bien guapo, you know, they're, they're getting handsome, you know, and I'm going to go ahead and buy a truck and, you know, and I've got all this stuff and this girl down the street's really attracted to me. Then they have a girlfriend. And they, their life here with all the sensual things and the sensational things that has come along with their new life in the United, you know, in the United States drowns out their family that is in Mexico. And, and this isn't a dig on Latinos by any means. Any nationality could do this. They just happen to be our neighbors. So the ones, can, you know, any nationality could do this. Even Americans do this. Men become so obsessed with their careers and their jobs that they ignore their family, and they choose that over their family eventually. You know, maybe a, a woman might become so interested in the banker man <laughs> that she leaves her blue-collared husband. We can do that the same way. But we've literally seen men driven by consumerism and by materialism, abandon their families that are back in Central America or Mexico. Very sad thing. Very sad thing. And by what? By driven by the, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life. Become so proud of themselves now that they have those things and that money. And a very sad thing that man is capable of but what did he say? He said, uh, that's, the, that's the way of the world. That's the drumbeat of the world, and it's a deadly drumbeat. And God has given us the command to march to a different drumbeat. And he said, come out and be separate, you know, and come out from her, lest you share in her plagues and the judgment that is given to her. And I say, because this is, I, this is the most important thing of today, that, you know, for us, that if you don't have a distinctive or a way of thinking and feeling and acting that's distinct from the world around you, there's something wrong. If you're not just really, maybe, maybe we're so used to it we don't notice, but I don't know about you, but I don't even want to walk by a Victoria's Secret in the mall. That is so inappropriate and disgusting and wrong to even merchandise those women who are vicing for the money to denude them in public why well, you say well there's you know there's it's consensual well i mean would you be okay with you know a grown man so you know seducing a, a young girl that you know and if it was consensual no you're you're being a predator to somebody you can manipulate. Hey, we'll give you money if you will denude yourself. Pornography, pornography stars. You know, not that those people who are denuded are innocent, but the people who are denuding. How wicked of them to manipulate and to entice and to pay them money. And, you know, and does that bother you? Did it bother you to watch a, a government manipulate people so horribly the last two or three years? And were you yourself manipulated by them to give in to their thinking and what's they, what they were instigating? Or, or could you see it and were you marching to a different drumbeat? You know, does it bother you for alcohol ads to, to communicate the idea that behind alcohol, everybody is happy and attractive? It's like, that is so absurd. You know, y'all ever see, you know, alcohol commercials, uh, you know, and you ever see any with unattractive people not having fun? 
I don't know if you've ever seen the results of alcohol, but it, it involves a whole lot of people not having fun, you know? And there's more people because of alcohol not having fun in this world than there are people having fun because of alcohol in this world. But you, you see that you look at things through a different lens and you understand things differently. What does the world teach you to do? It teaches you to make as much money as you possibly can. Whatever job that will pay you the most and wherever you can go to do the most. And, you know, and, and is that the way you think? In so many ways, and, you know, according to sensuality, right, and according to riches and according to pride, that's the way Babylon thinks and operates. That's the way the world thinks and operates. And God said that we should come out and be different and separate. You know, I, I, there was Paul in First Corinthians, First uh, Corinthians six seventeen says, "Therefore, therefore, come out from their midst and be and be separate," says the Lord, "and do not touch what is unclean, and I will welcome you." That we need to march to the beat of a different drum, and we need to think differently, and we need to act differently, and. And we see things very much differently from the way the world sees and acts. And he said, for her sins have piled up, verse 5, as high as the heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. This, this is a principle with God. You remember in Genesis chapter 6 that, that God looked at the world and he was grieved and he said every imagination and intent of their heart was evil continually. And yet he waited 120 years while Noah built the ark. And, but eventually things got up to the limit. And he told Abraham in Genesis chapter 15, he was telling him about where he was in the land of Shechem and there in the shoulders, Shechem his shoulders, in the promised land. And, and he said, you know, your, your descendants are going to go away for four generations, that, but they will come and they will... Return is what he told to them. He said, because the, the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet fulfilled. And he waited 400 years for the iniquity of the inhabitants of the land of Canaan, you know, before he brought judgment to them through his people in the Exodus. And so the same here in Babylon, that there's this idea, there's this thing that that God is waiting for this moment, for this time, when the iniquity of this world is fulfilled. And someday, I like the way Adrian Rogers say it, said it, that someday the waves of God's wrath are going to break through the dam of His mercy. And they're going to flood out through this world. And he said, verse 6, he said, Pay her back even as she has paid, and give back to her double according to her deeds, in the cup which she has mixed, mixed twice as much for her, to the degree that she has glorified herself and lived sensuously to the same degree, give her torment and mourning. And she says in her heart, I sit as a queen, and am, I am not a widow, and will never see mourning. For this reason, in one day her plagues will come, pestilence and mourning and famine, and she will be burned up with fire, and the Lord God who judges her is strong." She glorified herself. That's another. The third, there was uh, riches, there was sensuality, there was pride. I guess it's a good question. How do you glorify God? How do we glorify God? And I think maybe there's a real easy illustration in Scripture that was given when Moses went up on the mountain with God to stay. It was a one one-way ticket. And Joshua came into his place, and the people had the faith to cross the River Jordan. And they had the faith to follow through with the instructions given to them for the conquering of Jericho. And they went, and according to God's instructions, the marching around the city and the shouting when they're supposed to shout, and, and Jericho fell. And then after that, there was this little outpost called AI. And they said, well, you know, that's a little bitty thing. Let's, you know, we don't all need to go up. So they put a little, you know, 
army together and sent them up there, and they came back running, defeated. And Joshua didn't know what to do, and he went and fell on his face before God, and, and God said, get up. <laughs> get up, Joshua. And he says, uh, there's something banned in the camp. Because they weren't supposed to take anything from Jericho. And God told Joshua, no, there's something under the ban in the camp, and you need to find out. He said, tomorrow morning, he said, you need to call everybody by their tribe, and after that, you need to call them by their, their family, and after their family, you need to call them by their household, and after the household, by the individual man. And so Joshua got up the next day, and he did that very thing, tribe, family, household, man, and it came down to a man named Achan. And you find out that Achan was Achan for trouble. And here they pull Achan and his household, you know, and his family, I should say, forward. And it's so surprising that here this man in the middle of deliberate rebellion, very consequential rebellion that affected all of Israel that day. And Joshua, the words that Joshua said to him, Achan, give God the glory. What have you done? How many of you have ever committed an egregious sin and felt like in that moment you had no capacity to give God any glory whatsoever? I have. God, I can't believe I did that. I'm so ashamed of that. I promised I would never do that again. That is so... I, I just, I, you know, and that's when you just don't know about yourself anymore, God. You're like, I can't you know, and that's horrible. And you, you feel like you have zero capacity in that moment to give God the glory. But Joshua said, Achan, give God the glory. How can he do that? Mm, you know how he did it? He acknowledged the truth of God. He acknowledged the truth of God, and he said, yes. It's true. God is right, and I'm wrong. That was glorifying God. He said, yes, it's true. God's right, and I was wrong in what I did. I took a mantle and 200 shekels of silver, and they're hidden in my tent, is what he said. And that was giving God the glory. You know how we give God glory, is we acknowledge his truth. And if we want to do any better, we obey it. We acknowledge and obey His truth and what He says and what He has commanded. How do we glorify ourselves? We establish our own truth and obey that. Eve was the one that showed us how to do it first, you know. She said, well, God did say this and this and this, but, you know, it is a pretty fruit. And it is beneficial for knowledge. And I'll come up with my own reasoning and my own command, and I'll eat of this thing. That day Eve glorified herself. And Adam also. That he didn't even have to be deceived. He just out and out sinned. You know, so it's even worse. And in what he did, and so you stop and you think, well, how has she glorified herself? Listen, are, are people across this world not writing truths for themselves today? I don't think there's ever been a time in history where truth has been more blatantly attacked and irrationally perverted and to just be whatever you want it to be, you know? And it, that is, by logic alone, not possible. Because you can't make one truth. You know the only way to believe in relative truth is to believe that your thoughts are superior to your fellow man's. And if you're going to accept what you make up to be your truth, that you have to believe that you personally are superior to the person with an opposing view. And that you must be right and theirs must be wrong. That's self-promotion. That's self-glorification. And it's not even logical, it doesn't even make sense. But when there is sensuality and lust behind that to drive it, to cause you what you want to believe in order that you might do what you want to do, well, there, that's the reason why. But she glorified herself, and in one day what judgment came. And he said, and the kings of the earth who committed acts of immorality live sensuously with her. And, uh, and they will weep and lament over her when they see the smoke of her burning. 
standing at a distance because of fear of her torment, saying, Woe, woe, the great city Babylon, Babylon, the strong city, for in one hour judgment has come. I think it's really interesting for the next few verses. The kings and the rulers and the merchants, they do not grieve over the countless lives that are lost, but over the loss of prosperity. You know, we have more Americans right now so terrified that we're not going to be continue to be a wealthy nation, but not really so much bothered by abortion or horribly rising crime rates. You know, murders and deaths and fightings and all that stuff. But man, what if we become poor? Oh, that's, I, I wish conservatives in the last few years have been as concerned with godliness as we have been concerned with what if we go broke? What if we do? You know, honestly, I don't even pray for financial well-being in this country because it's my personal belief that economic disaster could be the best thing that could ever happen to the church here in the United States. And I'm, I'm ready to be poor, honestly. If it means a revival, I'm okay with being poor. I mean, we can biscuits and gravy and basics, you know. I, I don't believe God will let us starve to death. But how concerned are our conservatives, overly concerned, you know, primarily, predominantly concerned that we'll lose our money. We're losing our youth. My goodness, we're losing our youth. We're losing our marriages. We're losing our families. We're losing our churches. We're losing a lot more than money. But they're concerned, right, with the loss of money, not the loss of people. And the merchants of the earth weep and they mourn over her because no one buys their cargoes anymore. Cargoes of gold and silver and precious stones and pearls and fine linen and purple and silk and scarlet and every kind of citron wood and every article of ivory and every article made from very costly wood and bronze and iron and cinnamon and spice and incense and perfume and frankincense and wine and olive oil and fine flour and wheat and cattle and sheep uh, and cargoes of horses and chariots and slaves and human lives and the fruit you long for has gone from you and all the all that were luxurious and splendid have passed away from you and men will no longer find them they lose everything here in another couple chapters it talks about heaven and earth fleeing away the loss of everything the law i don't know if you all ever think about what kind of an impact that it's going to have psychologically on people I, I remember in boot camp how much I just wanted to get up and have a cup of coffee. I didn't have any coffee for whatever, 13 weeks. I, I just remember thinking, I, said, I just want to get up and have, you know, have my cup of coffee. You know, I just, you know, some simple little luxury, you know, and, and you don't realize how nice and how important it is. You know, people really lose their stuff when they just lose basic things. I've been to quite a few pre-ops visit, you know, in, in the hospital. And y'all know with a pre-op, you know what they make you do? You know, we can't eat anything, and you only have ice chips, right? You know, so you go to bed, the next day when you wake up, you don't eat anything and only ice chips. And they go into their pre-op at about 6 o'clock in the morning, and the doctors are in there playing ping pong or something, I don't know. And it's, it's 11 o'clock, right? They haven't had breakfast or... You know, even worse, maybe sometimes they haven't had a cigarette, you know, or a dip of snuff, you know, out there in the country. And, you know, and they haven't had their coffee. And you go in to meet these people that, you know, you go to church with and they love Jesus and all this stuff. And, and they're not too happy. These doctors, you know, and, I, you know I, I, I got shot the bird by a deacon one morning. I went in there, he wasn't happy, I wasn't, you know, too sympathetic, you know, I was giving a little bit of a hard time, and they came and put the little, you know, cap on his head, and I said, I like your hat. He told me I was number one. <laughs> <laughs> he was not a happy man. Why? Oh, just some basic, he didn't get coffee, he didn't get any food, he, you know, he, he dipped snuff also, so that made it even worse. You know, he had a, an addiction. And, but do you all realize the impact that it will have just to remove the luxuries from people's lives? 
I don't think people have really, in people, prosperous people that live in the United States have, have done the math to realize how, how dramatic, you know, even don't even go to the, the concept of hell yet. Go to the concept of losing everything that you know in this physical world. Comfort of air conditioning, the food that you want to eat. Anybody here love diets? I don't, you know what I mean? I want, I want that food, you know? I want cookies, you know? I don't want kale. I want cookies. And, and I'm not comforted by kale. And I don't enjoy it. I want cookies. You know, and there's something in me really strong that wants those cookies, you know, and I want my coffee in the morning, and I want my chair, and I want things that I do, and I go through, and, you know, and I, I want all my life, and the things in my life the way I want those things, but all those things are going to be taken away, that we're going to lose them. All of this stuff is going to perish, and you're not going to have it. They will lose everything, everything they had invested, what is in that. We are investing in a different kingdom, in a different thing imperishable, eternal, things that we cannot lose, things that will not be destroyed. You know, we're building on a foundation, like, like Paul said, with precious metals and stones which cannot be destroyed by the fiery judgment of God. And they will remain. And it's meaning that is eternal, and it goes on. And, it, you know, anybody who ever, has ever had a bout with pleasure, on the hindsight, looks back and says, well, what was the purpose of that? It's there and it's gone. And the only thing it does is call you back for another round and another loss of money and another loss of time and eventually with the loss of your life. And, and, but they lose everything. In the verse 15, the, the merchants of these things uh, who became rich from her will stand at a distance because of fear and torment of her torment, weeping and mourning, saying, Woe, woe, the great city, she who was clothed with fine linen and purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls. For in one hour such a great wealth has been laid waste, and every shipmaster and every passenger and sailor, and as many as make their living by the sea, stood at a distance and were crying out as they saw the smoke of her burning, saying, What city is like the great city? And they threw dust on their heads and were crying out, weeping and mourning, saying, Woe, woe, the great city in which all who had ships at, uh, at sea became rich by her wealth, for in one hour she has been laid waste. And, you know, you wonder why, you know, every time there's been numerous times the stock market has really dipped and crashed and whatnot, but you know it's really not uncommon at dramatic recessions, and even back at the complete failure of, of uh, the Great Depression, that there's people that actually commit suicide when they lose all of their wealth. I think, why would they do that? Because that was all that they were. And all that they had, and all the meaning, and all the purpose of their life, and it was all in that. And it crashed. And their world crumbled, and it was all gone, and there was nothing left, and that's why people do that thing. You ever wonder why people forfeit everything? Almost every Wednesday night when I stop at the racetrack on the way home from here, there's one or two or three homeless individuals hanging out there. There's Wi-Fi, there's a place they can sit, you know, and why would somebody forfeit everything for a drug or a substance because that is all of their life. It's everything, and it's all invested into that, that feeling and that sensation. And when that is gone, it's devastating. And you stop me, but that's, that's the situation that these people are in. And that is so important that why our hope and our life and our purpose and our meaning is not anchored in anything in this world. And when you lose all the money you have, it doesn't mess you up because that's not what you're here for. And even when you lose your health, it doesn't mess you up because that's not your meaning or your purpose. Or the outcome, you, you see what I mean is that when you, your life and your purpose are anchored in God and His kingdom and His calling on your life, there's nothing that the devil can jerk the rug out from you, under you with, so as to destroy your foundation or the meaning or your purpose or the outcome of your life. 
that it's secure in God, it's eternal, it's protected, it's all those things. These people lose all. And he said, verse 20, he said, Rejoice over her, O heaven, and you saints and apostles and prophets, because God has pronounced judgment for you against her. Remember when he said, Vengeance is mine, I shall repay. In verse 21 it says, And a strong angel took up a stone like a great millstone and threw it into the sea, saying, Thus will Babylon, the great city, be thrown down with violence and will not be found any longer. And the sound of the harpists and the musicians and the flute players and the trumpeters will not be heard in you any longer. And no craftsman or any craft will be found in you any longer. And the sound of a mill will not be heard in you any longer. And the light of a lamp will not shine in you any longer. And the voice of the bridegroom and the bride will not be heard in you any longer. For your merchants were the great men of the earth because all the nations were deceived by your sorcery. And in her was found the blood of the prophets and of the saints and of all who have been slain on the earth. Uh, I don't really know that this is complete, but rather a partial idea. And I think that you can look at the last 25 years, at least since 19... 90, yeah, around then, 20, is that, that's, that's more than that, isn't it? <laughs> Last 30 years, and, and see, you know, that by, we're deceived by your sorcery, uh, that's actually the word pharmacus, pharmakia, the, you know, it's, it was black magic, but it was also medicine, and I really believe that medicine has a great deal to do with Antichrist, uh, not only in holding medical solutions over the heads of people. You know, if he can create a great biological tragedy and offer the cure, well, then he's got a great amount of power over people. But not only that, but I think that pharmaceuticals have been playing a role worldwide for the last 30 years to make people emotionally numb and to deal with sorrow and angst and anxiety and all those things. It's really frustrating to me as a pastor and as an evangelist, although I don't believe I have the gift of evangelism, I, I work towards it, that so many of the drugs that we have now are actually contrary to that. And the hardship that's in people's lives to cause to, to, to drive them to God you know, and anxieties that need to be answered in the person of God so often for the last 20 years are being treated with drugs. And, you know, maybe there's a time and a place, and I don't know, but I think the overall outcome of it is not good. And I can't say, you know, that every situation, but, but nevertheless, you know, do you have a problem? Well, here's a pill to fix it. And this will be your solution. And this will make you feel better. Anybody ever see that cartoon that has two lines and over a really long line it says surgery and pills and over a really short line it says change of lifestyle? And, uh, you know, there's one, but I mean, it's America to the core, right? You know, and how do we fix this? You know, we don't, well, we get surgery and pills, you know, that's what we, that's what we do. And not necessarily a change of lifestyle or a turning into God or or something in that way. But nevertheless, they were deceived by her sorcery. You know, magic, uh, medicines, whatever it may have been, deceptions. He does say that he'll come with all lying signs and wonder. Uh, but verse 24, And it was found in her the blood of the prophets, the blood of the saints, here in this Babylon. And not only that, but all who have been slain on the earth because listen babylon is not only destructive outwardly it's destructive inwardly and i really believe that's that's one of the distinctions between 17 and 18 because if you go back to to chapter 17 you find that there's some inward violence and destructions you know that i read earlier that the ten horns which you saw in the beast will hate the harlot and will make uh, her desolate 
If you go back to Daniel chapter 11 and you read through there the description of the Antichrist that's given, and, and, and there it's, it's a duality of prophecy. They're talking about a man named Antiochus Epiphanes that came along shortly before Christ and who went into the temple and sacrificed a pig. That's a historical fact. And, and there also that points to another thing in the future when Antichrist at three and a half years into the tribulation will go into the temple and whatever it is, uh, G Jesus described it as the abomination of desolation. And he wasn't referring to the historical event behind him. He was referring to a future event that was ahead of him. He was referring to the Antichrist. And at that point, he, he declares himself to be God. That will be a big transitional period in the, in the time of tribulation. And I really believe the difference between these two chapters is 17. They're talking about masses of people duped in false religion, which I believe will largely be nominal Christians all around this world who have Christianity merely as a religion in their life, but do not know him. They say unto him, Lord, Lord, but he's never known them, like Matthew chapter 7 describes. And the duped into false religion, you know, because that's the way it describes in chapter 17 that he seduces them and he deceives them and he promises them wealth and safety and security. And midway through, he turns on them and starts persecuting them, just like Antiochus Epiphanes did to the Jews. And I believe that's what's reflected in chapter 17, when he said, And the ten horns which you saw, and the beast, these will hate the harlot, and will make her desolate and naked, and eat her flesh, and will burn her up with fire. And God has put it in his hearts to execute his purpose by having a common purpose, and by giving their kingdom to the beast until the words of God should be fulfilled. And so uh, there is that. And then the Antichrist goes on from that point at three and a half years to have a different kind of kingdom in a different light. And at that point, he declares himself to be God. And he will be the object of worship. And I believe that's what's reflected in chapter 18. But truly... That ideology and that kind of thinking has been responsible for the death of people in this world, you know, for wars <laughs> and quarrels and fightings, like James put it in James chapter 4. But I think the most important thing for us, what can we do with it all? Listen for a different drumbeat. If the world says you need this, ask God if you really do. You know, you, you young people, I don't know how many of you are, but everything that you see on social media and in the, our culture will tell you, ah, just live with your boyfriend or girlfriend before you get married, right? You need to test drive the vehicle. God says don't do that. You know, there's just one example, you know, where the world says one thing and God says another, and we need to be distinct. We need to be different. Let's pray. Father, Lord, bless us to know your truth, God. God, that it would pierce through all the noise and the deception and the constant bombardment of worldly thinking in our lives, God, and even things, even perceptions and ideas that we have that are not of you. I know we still have some of those. Lord, let them be exposed and be done away with, God, and that we might see things the way you see them and do things the way you do them. Lord, I pray that you would bless us spiritually, God, to mature and to be able to even hear that drumbeat, God, that you play. Like the Scripture says in Ephesians, trying to learn the things that are pleasing to Him, God, I think more than anything, I want... I want to know my Heavenly Father well enough to know immediately what is pleasing to Him and what is displeasing to Him. I know my earthly Father well enough to know 
how he sees things and feels about things and how he would react to things. And I want us to know you that way, God, that we're close enough to you that we don't know about you, but we know you, and we know how to please you. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.